All nation states owe their existence to a monopoly on violence, but only a dying nation is forced to expose that fact. The United States is a nation in its death throes. In this video, we're going to explain why. During times of stability, there are three monopolies that maintain the power of the state. Three pillars of power that all governments depend on. One, the control of ideas and belief. Two, the control of money and finance. And three, the monopoly on violence. Most people would never consider laws and legal systems as the control of ideas. But did you ever consider what makes the law any different than any other note that you might write on a piece of paper? The answer is belief. The belief in the legitimacy of a government and its subsequent right to impose limits and requirements on the behavior of the people is all that gives written law the illusion of power. I know what you might be thinking, but the police enforce those laws, and if I don't comply, they throw me in a cage. Indeed they do, but why? Why does a policeman feel that he has the right to do this? Why does the average citizen feel that they have the obligation to comply? And why does the rest of the population feel that they don't have the right to stop the man with the badge from grabbing a citizen and putting him in jail? It's because the policeman, the citizen, and the rest of society are mesmerized by their belief in authority. It all comes down to belief. The control of belief is actually the linchpin that makes the other three monopolies possible. For many millennia, the church worked in tandem with the state to help maintain the fabric of belief by supporting the doctrine of the divine right of kings. Today, that role is filled by the media and the education system. Television has become the temple of the 21st century. Newscasters, the priests, selling us the divine right of the state in the guise of democracy, and state-run schools complete the job by teaching a philosophy that legitimizes state violence without ever questioning the moral foundations of that paradigm. But this situation is rapidly changing. The U.S. government's aura of legitimacy has been severely tarnished, and the awareness of that stain is spreading like a virus throughout society as more and more people turn away from the mainstream media. The control of belief, which has for so long been used to lend support to the power elite, is rapidly slipping from their hands. They've lost control of the dialogue. This is why the government keeps trying to get control of the internet. In the United States, as is the case in the majority of the world, the control of money is no longer held by the government. This power was handed over to the Federal Reserve in 1913, and the Federal Reserve is owned by a conglomerate of the most powerful private banks in the world. By giving the power to coin money to private banks, a new branch of government was created, one that is not at all accountable to the people, and which cannot be voted out of office. This is the essence of fascism, the merger of corporate and government power. But what is money anyway? We can talk about the technicalities of what a dollar is today, and how it is essentially a unit of debt backed by nothing, created out of thin air. And we can discuss what it used to be, but what is the underlying principle? What is the common denominator between paper money, digital money, metal money, and the cacao beans used by the ancient Mayans for money? The answer, once again, is belief. People give their labor and their goods in exchange for money because they have faith that they will be able to use that money to obtain labor and goods from others in the future. It is this faith that actually creates what we call value. However, the belief that a unit of currency is valuable can only be maintained if certain conditions are met. Either the substance itself has to have some inherent usefulness, as was the case for cacao beans of the Mayans, or there must be something that creates an artificial demand for the currency, such as forced taxation. In the case of the US dollar, the fact that oil can only be purchased in the global market using US dollars creates this artificial demand on the international level. But this is a topic in and of itself. In either case, the quantity of the currency must not grow too quickly or forces of supply and demand will cause the perceived value to drop. Outside the petrodollar anomaly, forced taxation is the primary method used by states to generate the artificial demand for the official currency. Without the official demand that taxes be paid in a specific currency, communities would have nothing preventing them from creating their own currencies which cut out the banker middleman. Forced taxation seems non-violent to most people because they choose to comply. However, most people aren't aware of the fact that they're making a choice by complying. They have come to believe that compliance is an obligation. But this is just another example of the control of belief making violence unnecessary in most cases. However, if one refuses to comply with these taxes, what happens? Agents of the state come to put you in a cage. They don't do this for financial reasons. Imprisoning tax resistors costs the state many times more than they could ever hope to recover. They put you in prison to make an example out of you and to strike fear in the hearts of all those who might be thinking of doing the same. So you see, the states actually use the monopoly on violence to maintain the control of belief and the control of money. And the flip side of that equation is also true. It's circular. Essentially, the three pillars of power all lean in on each other, and if any one of them is removed, they all come falling down. The monopoly on violence has also been blurred in the United States as military defense contractors such as Blackwater operate private armies in theaters of war and domestically, as was the case in Hurricane Katrina. 
The use of mercenaries is nothing new. It's a practice as old as prostitution and almost as dignified. But what is new is the immense financial power and political influence that these mercenary armies and the military industrial complex in general has accumulated. Combine that with an unfettered revolving door between the war industry and the government and you have a recipe for disaster. It shouldn't be surprising what you get when an industry which depends on war for survival has influence over the government. In the United States, all three pillars of power have fallen into corporate hands. This is fascism, pure and simple. Corporations are not moral citizens. Their only interest is the bottom line. As such, the rule of law has been brushed aside. From the perspective of a multinational corporation, such details are just pesky obstacles. But this trend towards corruption has consequences. It has eroded the faith and belief of the people in the legitimacy of the government. It has led to rampant looting of the treasury, massive money printing, and a national debt of over $16 trillion and growing faster by the day. Just the financial aspect of this equation is enough to guarantee a collapse. At this point, it cannot be fixed. But it can be prolonged, and that's why we're seeing these endless wars. These are desperate attempts to maintain American global dominance and to prevent a move away from the dollar. In summary, fascism has corrupted all three pillars of power in the United States, and as a result, those pillars are crumbling. Those that are running the system can see this. They can see it and they're scared because they know at this point, there's nothing they can do to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. All they have left is a monopoly on violence and that monopoly is not complete. The founders of the United States wanted to make sure that the government had to share that power with the people. Hence, they created the Second Amendment. How then is a corrupt government which has abandoned the rule of law and the aura of legitimacy that came with it to hold on to power as the house of cards comes tumbling down? The answer should be obvious. They have to take away the counterbalance of the Second Amendment. And that's exactly what they're trying to do. There's just one little problem with this proposition. For many Americans who have been watching with growing distrust as their country becomes more and more of a police state, the Second Amendment is their line in the sand. Taking that right away, even incrementally, is actually accelerating the awakening of the public. And in the process, the enforcement arm of the government is beginning to question the chain of command. Without their enforcement arm, what power will the government have? None whatsoever. That's when the current system will draw its final breath and the people will be left to decide how we're going to rebuild. But it's important to understand here that the state is not going to go down without a fight. They see the shift in ideas. They see the growing resistance to their dominance. And they see us reaching out to the police and military. They see the police and military that are waking up in droves. The scores of sheriffs that have already begun publicly stating that they will not allow the enforcement of new gun laws in their county. That's why in places like the West Point Military School, they're attempting to categorize anti-federal government activists in with terrorists. It's a desperate move one that could backfire. But we can't afford to be passive and hope that it backfires. We have to make sure that it backfires. We have to keep up the pressure. We have to keep reaching out to the police and military, reminding them of the oath that they took to defend the Constitution and what that means. It may be that we could do better than the Constitution. It may be that a higher document could someday be written that adheres to the non-aggression principle. But the simple fact of the matter is that we will never get that chance if we allow our nation to slip into an overt dictatorship. We must preserve the Constitution into the collapse so that the people will have the power to dictate what comes next.